Good morning and welcome to this week's Jump Discussion. And this week we're discussing how to grow your revenue and profitability quicker. I've got some sort of UK stats from the UK recruitment market over the last sort of 12 months to see what's actually happening. So there's a shortfall of 2.5 million skilled workers in the UK and that current shortfall is costing the UK something around £6.6 .6 billion uh, pounds per year. 95% of the UK business admits to making at least one bad hire decision every year and 59% of the business uh, businesses in the UK are hiring using recruitment agencies. So that says there is a lot of businesses out there not using recruitment agencies that we can be, be going at. 70% of the enterprise size market are using ATS to screen their candidates and the average cost of hiring an employee in the UK is £6,125 and 43% percent of the companies who use some form of AI in the interview process. Um, the recruitment industry contributed £44.4 billion to the UK economy in 2023, and that accounts for 1.8% of the UK gross value, so a massive part of that. And according to the ONS, they reported that vacancies that now stood at 8,441. 8, 8, 8, between July and September, which is a decrease of 4% on the previous quarter. And although vacancies remain high at 56 higher than pre-pandemic levels, mm. they're also down by 14% compared to the same period last year. But make, make that point, it's 56 higher than it was pre-pandemic levels. The average time to hire is still 4.8 weeks. 68% of employers are confident in their ability to hire people that they need in the coming quarter, but that's fallen from 77% in quarter two. And finding candidates with the right skills continues to be the top challenge for recruiters, and 64% of those people said that. Uh, as we move towards the end of the year, employers are weighing up their recruitment plans. And as it stands, 23% of businesses expect to increase their recruitment in Q4 and going into 2025. That's a drop of 27% from Q3. However, some companies are planning to strengthen their workforce through hiring temporary workers, which always happens when we come back after a, a sort of a small uh, decrease and small bad ma Blip. hard market, blip in the market, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Blip. Uh, hiring confidence also has taken a hit with just 68% of recruiters believing that they will be able to successfully fill and find people they need in Q4. And that's down by 77% in Q3. And the most confident sectors in the market are IT, which again always comes back after a blip, manufacturing, construction, logistics and finance and accounting. So there's a lot that we can be looking at for 2025 to help our business become grow revenue and become more profitable. This week, I'm joined by Paul and Heather, Dave and Martin. I believe they're both up in Scotland, I believe. Um, not too sure what they're doing up there, but they're, they're up in Scotland. So let's kick off. Heather, it's good to have you back. I've not seen you for a while. So welcome back. We'll try not to ask Thank you the you. First, first question as always, but, <laughs> but, but we never know. So the first question is, how was your mum's birthday? No, but the, <laughs> it was the, delightful. Thanks, Howard. Really. So the question is, what strategies have you found most effective increasing job fill ratios? And how do you balance speed with quality in the placement process? I mean, I think this is a really, really big question, um, Howard. Uh, uh, I, let me start. I think there's three areas. One is that you have to qualify vacancies really tightly. I know we're going to get into this a bit later on. In other words, making sure that the jobs you're, you've registered, as it were, from clients aren't just a digital email, not coming from just a digital job description that you have had a deep and very thorough meeting, ideally, with your client um, to establish precisely what it is that they're asking you to find, bearing in mind that most recruitment businesses work on a contingent basis. So before you start plunging lots and lots of time and energy, even money into trying to fill a role, make sure that it's something that we can actually fill in the first instance and understand very clearly what the commitment is from your client. Are you just one of five, ten agencies they've just chucked the CV, the, the job description out to? <clears throat> or are you in a position where you can qualify it really tightly and you discover that it's an urgent job that they need to fill quickly and you're one or one of two agencies working on it? So qualifying. The second thing is, and I've just said it quickly, but I think it's about constant meetings with clients. Um, if you want to increase your job fill ratios, 
and you know your interviews to placement ratio um, that's going to come about because of your knowledge deep knowledge of your client uh, understanding not just what the job description is around but the culture of the company so that you can make the right personality match and the only way you're ever going to discover what that looks like or feels like is to be consistently in front of your clients so you're matching candidates from a cultural perspective as well as a um, an experience and skill sets perspective and then i think the last point is about candidate attraction because when you're talking about fill uh, rates um, and ratios you need a constant flow of good quality candidates but importantly and again we'll get to this um, you need to be constantly looking at how you keep your candidates engaged with your business um, we must remember that the majority of candidates that we are able to place in new jobs are already in jobs they're not actively looking for new jobs so there's three elements to this and i'm afraid it would take me and you guys hours to, to really drill into each of those points and we don't have that but those are the three elements that you need to be very aware of and i think those are those are right paul they are absolutely the the, the basics but for me they're summed up by work in partnership with your client mm. so be a consultant not a job filler yes. yeah we we too often um are so excited to get a role get a new client on board have something to you know to go at especially early on in our careers that that we we think that's where the process is you know we're done we've got the job in there but you know what that really deep relationship with your client the belief and the reality that we are a partner um, in this, that we are planning for this together, that we are planning. We've got our interview slots set up in advance because your client believes, trusts that you're going to fill those interview slots. All those little things that are about real, genuine, deep partnership and consultancy yeah. rather than just following the recruitment process. So that, for me, it's about the best strategy is deep, deep, deep relationships with your clients. I'm going to go even more basic than that. Go I for think... it, Howard. We like it when you're basic. <laughs> then, oi, oi. We don't want any oi, of that oi. on the web now. Okay. So, <laughs> your I... mind, Jacob. <laughs> yes, yes. Give, give, give that man a bar of soap to eat. Um, <laughs> I think the problem is, is this. As the market gets tight and requirements become harder to come by, Recruiters get desperate to fill a job. And therefore, we spend an awful lot of time working on jobs that we are never, ever going to fill. They are unfillable. They're looking for the purple unicorn. And yet we spend time hiding behind these jobs trying to fill them. So we've got to start to think that if that is happening, we've got to be better actually looking at the jobs that we're looking at look at the fillability of those jobs and reject everything that we do not think that we can fill. And therefore you spend more time working on jobs that you can fill and therefore you're working with candidates that can be placed into those jobs, which means you're creating that vacuum effect. Once you take a ca candidate out, you've got the vacuum effect to put another candidate in where you've just taken them out. And that's the simplest way to start to increase your client opportunity, but increase your fill ratio. Stop working jobs that you, you're we're just never going to fill and therefore the other side of this coin is you know we're going to start to develop our crms to be more in tune with what the clients actually want at the moment and everyone keeps talking about clients want service they want trust they want reliability etc actually what a client wants at the moment is a candidate they want <laughs> a really good candidate and it's as simple as that i've got clients that are you know less than 10 weeks into the recruitment market as in they've never been in the recruitment market, have just opened up, and they've opened up into three of the big four consultancies. They've opened up into IBM and other areas, mainly because they're taking good candidates to market and saying, this you're not going to get any elsewhere. So you need to look at your C CRM. How many candidates have you got on your CRM? What can you do with those candidates on your CRM? And then start to look at how you can start to put more of those candidates into the marketplace. So to fill job ratios, you've got to start to think you've got to have more candidates to fill those ratios. If your store's empty and you're having to go out and fight in the marketplace for the candidates that are looking for a job, you're missing the point. We keep talking about we work in the passive marketplace. Well, now's the time to start to exercise your passive market recruitment knowledge and starting to put those candidates into roles because there's still 
simple fact remains, 60% of the employable market will take a job if the right job appears for them. So we've got to stop working rubbish and start to work roles that actually are worth working from there. Absolutely. So it's a competitive market. We know it's a competitive market and it's not going to get any easier in the UK. It's going to remain the most competitive market in the world. So how can recruitments differentiate themselves to attract clients and candidates who genuinely respect and value their service? So I'll pick up on the word or the words you guys have used, which is about being consultative. Uh, firstly, I think you've got to be a specialist. You've got to be a recognizable brand. Um, you know, the old days of being just a generalist recruitment business uh, are, are on the wane. You, you do need to position yourself to be an expert or experts in specific areas. Um, and you can see that when you look around the landscape in the UK now. Um, it's no longer the case that, as it used to be in the old days, where we had IT recruiters. Now they're very, for example, now they're very specific about what areas in IT they work. You know, you need to be very clear about your focus, and then you need to be shouting about that focus on social media, through your uh, website, your whole EVP employer value proposition needs to be screaming about. Uh, your organization and the values that you embrace and the val and the behaviors. I think that it's a small thing maybe to say this, but it's an incredibly important thing. Uh, we often talk about touch points uh, in an organization. So uh, when you call a business, whether that's uh, on a personal level or it's from a business perspective, the person you speak to, the first person you speak to, defines in your mind the quality of the service and the reputation of the organization. So it comes down to making sure that our people are all very well coached, that they know exactly how to handle clients and candidates in a professional way, in a courteous fashion. It's not just left to their, disc at their discretion in terms of how they manage people, the candidates and their clients, that the service levels are in your mind as a business owner of optimum importance. If you provide a red carpet treatment to people, they do spread the word. And I don't think there's a, any shortcut to that. The experience you get with any product, with any organization is the one that lasts from the first time that you connect with them. So that to me is a super important point. And I think that also, we often say this these days, that there needs to be um, a recognition that in recruitment, you have to be a marketeer now. It's no good playing with it. You have to be very conscious of how you look to the public, to your clients and candidates on social media and through all the channels and your website. And indeed how, as I've just said, you approach and speak to people. These things are super important. Um, standing out is, is, the, is not easy in an overcrowded market. And I think what you're no, always... Paul, I'm going to... Sorry, I want to disagree with you. I think okay. standing out in a market is is actually what we need to be doing. No, I'm not saying we the... shouldn't be doing it, but it's difficult yeah. in the sense that you've got to look for areas where you can improve upon um, the performances and the service levels of others. What I was about to say is reinventing recruitment isn't going to happen. What you have to do <laughs> is give yourself an edge by doing better things, doing things differently and better. Um, and I 100% agree with right. that. But the idea that it's not easy <laughs> is the bit that I maybe disagree with. There are, from a candidate perspective, I'm being deliberately controversial, you, you, you get. But, <laughs> not, not, but not from, a candidate, <laughs> from a candidate point of view... Yeah. Sadly, the, yeah. the recruitment industry that we love and we know how powerful and effective it can be has a terrible reputation. Yes. And and it has sometimes a terrible reputation because we trash ourselves in, in on, on LinkedIn. I've seen this morning a recruiter trashing our industry. You know, that you know, I I think that there are so many things that we can do to make ourselves stand out from the poor practice that does still happen. Um, and sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, but the reputation we have is is not great with candidates. Right? I know, I, know, and, I and agree. So I think we've yep. just got to be better yep. at being transparent and honest about the level of service they can expect. Because sometimes it's not actually the recruiter's fault that the, the candidates are unhappy, right? Because they're 
overwhelmed, especially at the moment, overwhelmed with candidates and work and, and, and things like that. But it's the, have we set the right expectation of the service level? And I, I, don't, I, and I completely listen. We're not in disagreement. I agree yeah. with you. And I do think that um, something worth saying, and then obviously Howard wants to jump in, is that we often talk about candidates and clients. Yeah. It's what we They're always the same people, same people right? right? So, yeah. you know, and I know that there is, and your point is, and I can, uh, everyone listening to this, in, and including me, can give examples of awful service to candidates, particularly. They're like cannon fodder very often, and it's wrong, yeah. wrong, wrong, because these are the people that we place in jobs, but equally important, they're the people that ultimately become our potential clients in 5, yeah. 10, 15 and years, right? And really understanding that and building that into your process and your service level is, for me, the one thing that will differentiate you and make you stand out. Yeah, yeah it seems obvious, but that's the bit we're missing. We we absolutely treat candidates like cannon fodder. and We forget that they're real people. And we've got to be really honest about what we can and can't do for them. And instead of which, we promise the world and then under deliver. Now, Howard's going to come in with some oblique comments, so we'll let him come in. Come on, Howard, it's your turn. I'm just going to come in to say, this is Heather's response to me this morning about today's webinar. Just look at today's question. I'm not sure I can add anything. <laughs> you know, Heather. Uh, I'm not sure I can add anything, Heather. Okay, fine. Uh, right, so he Heather has added zero, to this she's added zero to this conversation. And I think what you're both talking about is absolutely spot on you know we need to increase our contact with both parties we spend mm. a fortune marketing socially as in social media marketing email marketing exit to, to our clients 43 percent of recruiters give up after the first call to a client mm. so we need to develop a recall strategy where we actually are building relationships and therefore the call strategy has to be about what are you going to talk to that client about because they don't want to talk about service. They don't want to talk about recruitment process at the moment. So what do they actually want to talk about? So we actually start to create that and train our recruiters on that process. Then we can start to get more in-depth relationships. We then start to think about, you know, the biggest gain that you can make in 2025 is being close to your candidates, becoming mm -hmm. the key person of influence in your market. A hundred percent. Yes. The go-to point. So we've got to stop using candidates as a throwaway product. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've used this analogy, and I'll, I'll use it again. I've used this analogy loads and loads uh, with clients that we treat candidates like a one-night stand. Yeah, we, we this, really do. We have this real <laughs> intense relationship, <laughs> and then we never speak to them again. And yeah. then a year later, we think, oh, actually, that candidate could do something for me. I'll have a conversation with them, and they never, ever want to talk to you. And yeah. there's a reason why something like it's 86% of all permanent candidates placed by recruitment agencies never go back to that agency that placed them. Wow. What does that say yeah. about our yeah, relationships? That's true. That's true. And there? So if we put you know, our candidates at the same pedestal that our clients are on, exactly, and we start to think, right – I was with a client on Monday and they were talking about their pipeline. Their pipeline was just over 50K. So I'll use 50K for simple maths. I said, okay, and how many av on average CVs do you get across? Oh, between three and five. Let's use the basic number of three. And she went, okay. So that means your client pipeline is 50K. Your candidate pipeline, those are 150K. And the question went, yeah, but I can only place one of the candidates. No, you can place all three of the candidates, but you can only place one of them in the job that in you've got. Exactly, exactly that. In that, that. job. Yeah. So are we then focusing on the wrong pipeline? Yes. And therefore, if we focus on the correct pipeline and have candidates going to multiple opportunities rather than going to one opportunity, then it becomes a very thing. So if you want to <clears> differentiate <throat> yourself in your marketplace, yeah. have product that clients need and have clients that your products want to be represented to. Make sure you're putting the candidate and the client out there constantly. Yep. And to do that, you have to have a closer relationship with your candidates. Well, just a quick point, Howard, simple. on this. And I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, I'm back to my office angels days. We had a very simple adage and it was all about getting great jobs, uh, getting great jobs for great people. So we trained our people to find candidates jobs. And, and we I guess we place very limited emphasis on filling jobs. That may sound a bit odd. I mean, obviously we were trying to fill jobs, but the real skill is yeah, finding a candidate and doing around, something right? with that great candidate. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more with you. And back even 
<laughs> in the 70s when I started with the old Alfred Marx Bureau, again, our job was to see a candidate, get them through interviews in those days before they left the office. All about the candidate. I very rarely see that anymore in our industry. We see candidates coming in. If we don't have a job that suits them, we don't do anything with them. They sit in the, the CRM and they never get spoken to again. It's awful. It's dreadful. And they don't even just not get spoken to again, Paul. They don't get responded to when they try no. to communicate with us. No, it's truly <laughs> awful. I mean, I, I, had a situ I, I had a situation where my stepdaughter, I recommended to a particular recruitment business. She's a really good PA, executive PA. She went and met them and never heard from them again. Not even a phone call. I mean, it's yeah. just awful, awful. So let's move that question then. With technology sort of evolving rapidly as, as it is, what's the most impactful tool or system that you could recommend for streamlining recruitment processes and improving profitability? I mean, I think we get it. We are there already. And I mean, people listening here uh, will already have certain levels of technology and AI involved in their businesses. We know that with new technology, um, initially the launch of something brand new that everybody wants, it tends to be very expensive. Um, and then gradually as the technology improves and evolves, the cost is, it gets less and less. And I think the things that recruitment businesses are really looking at now, apart from upgrade, a lot of people I'm working with today have been upgrading their CRMs recently in the last 12, 18 months have got better quality CRMs. And I think that's super important. And although having said that, once you get the CRM, make sure you use it because it doesn't matter. It's no good constantly saying to people like me, our CRM's rubbish. Well, it's only rubbish if you don't put information into it. So um, I think make sure you use it. There are some very good quality CRMs out there. But then there are other things you can do. I mean, a lot of things that will save you time are worth looking at. For example, note taking. So, you know, having a meeting with a candidate or a client, particularly on, on Zoom or or on Teams or whatever. Can, you don't have to write up the notes. The software is out there to enable those notes to be taken. There are phone systems now that will take notes and commute that information directly into your CRM. So anything that can be done to limit the amount of time that your people spend making notes, writing notes on meetings, conversations with candidates can be done automatically and stuck straight into the CRM. That's worth looking at. And then I think the other thing I would add is, and we've talked about it, it's um, looking at the CTS systems, um, keeping close to candidates, um, making sure that software, and there's plenty of that out there, will enable you to consistently engage with and keep close to the good quality candidates that, or any candidates in a sense, that you put onto the system who remain engaged with your organization that you can then dip into and use when obviously a role comes in and you, you're then looking for those, as you put it, was it pink or purple? unicorns that you mentioned earlier. So I, I'm not going to name names of software. Um, there are plenty out there, but those are the areas. Anything that saves your people time to spend instead directly in front of clients and candidates is where you should be aiming those guns of yours. Yeah, and, and this, this, Howard, this was the question specifically that made me think, well, I'm not quite sure what I've got, got to add today. I, I couldn't name the systems, but I'm sure you're going to. But what I would say is this stuff is evolving really fast. Yeah. So if you've got systems already in your business, before you go and buy something new, go back to the provider of your systems and find out what's changed. Because very often they're updating the um, what's available on your existing systems. And a lot of organizations don't know what they've got. So do some work on what you've already got. Are you using it properly? Are, have you got the latest version or the latest updates have you have you reminded people how to use it and what you're supposed to be doing so use what you've got um and and make sure you're talking to your providers regularly about the changes they have made to your live systems so that you know what's changed and how would you will have much more specific things than that i'm um, sure to say well so like paul i'm not going to mention uh certain crms because you know, there's, there's a lot out there and it's 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 about which tool fits your business more than anything else. But I think the most impactful tool that I can recommend is I'm going to crib on the back of what you've just said there, Heather, is the recruiter. Yeah. We have loads and loads of tech, but we don't train our recruiters to use it. And I've, I've described this again as simply, it's like buying a Ferrari and only driving it in first because no one's yeah. learned to drive. <laughs> 
Yeah, you're still going to get from A to B, but if you learn how to drive, you're going to get there yeah. a lot quicker, yeah. a lot yeah. faster. If yeah. you use the nav navigating system, you're going to get there a lot easier. You know, ensure it's full of fuel. You know, ensure the tires at the right pressure. But we don't. We just think because someone said when we we're selling it, the system is so intuitive, you're bound to be able to use it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And it is. The simplicity yeah. part is very intuitive. But the bits that actually make it tick and make it work and create time, and that's what it's all about. It's about creating more time so you can invest that time with your clients and your candidates. So I think what Paul said, we don't do that. So let's not talk about new tech tools until we learn to use our current tools and use them properly. So the most impactful tool you'll have is you. Mm. And then to add to Paul's profanity, otherwise you are the tool. <laughs> I love that. But and you know, if you're if if you're slightly uncomfortable with your technology, right? It's not your area of expertise as a recruitment leader. There are loads of really good consultants out there who can help you. You know, come to us, we'll make a referral for you. There are some really great tech specialists in recruitment who will help you understand what are the tools you've got already and what could you be doing with them that you're not currently doing. Yeah. So let's move that very quickly into a yeah. question then. What are the red flags should recruitment agencies watch for when evaluating or yeah, evaluating which client or which candidate to invest their time and resource? OK, so listen, I'm, I'm, you were talking about basics um, a moment ago. I'm going to take you right back to basics to answer this question, because there's nothing else that has ever, in my mind, um, been more relevant than what I was taught when I was 19. So three things you need to ask clients and candidates. Same questions, but in a slightly different way. How urgent do you need to fill the job? The urgency is everything. If you, there's no urgency from a client or a candidate, there is no point in trying to help them because you will waste an awful lot of time. How much pain or discomfort do they feel? Does the client feel discomfort? Do they need to fill the role immediately, as soon as possible? You have to stress test this. Uh, and if they feel a level of discomfort, then you've got a good chance of assisting them. If there is a sense of manana, you know, well, if you find someone, let me know. They're on the back burner, and the same applies to candidates. They need to be committed, very committed. Number one, urgency. Number two, how many other recruitment businesses have got this role from a client perspective? If you're the only one, you've got a great chance if it's linked to urgency. If you're one of seven, ten, then again, think hard. Again, same question to the candidate. How many other recruitment businesses are you working alongside? Um, how many other people are helping you? And then the third question relates to how long have you been looking? So how, how long have you had this role available for? If it's just become available, again, tick in the box. If it's been out there for two, three months, to come back to the unicorn um, point, then there's a reason why it's taken so long to fill the job. Maybe the job is unfillable. And that applies to the candidate. If they've been looking for a very long time, why have they been looking for a very long time? These are the three stress testers. I was taught that when I was 19. I still teach people this, these points today in 2024. You have to ask the right questions in order to establish whether it's somebody that is a grade one or a grade two or a grade three, if I can put it in that in that way. Uh, I, I've got absolutely nothing to add to that, Paul. It is that it's about very carefully qualifying your candidates and your clients. And those red flags are bang on, you know, and, you know, even if there were dinosaurs roaming when you learned that, people are still people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll take that. At least you didn't call me the dinosaur, so I'm happy with that. That's okay. So, but, you know, those those things haven't changed, right? Those are absolutely still the red exactly the right That's way. exactly what happens. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go back to basics then, Paul, as, as, as you've said, and I'm going to go back to our first conversation, our first question to today about people getting desperate. How many times do you know Oh, it, it, you sat there talking to a consultant and the consultant says, I knew the candidate was going to fall out. 
I knew the client wasn't going to do this. Well, hang on, if you knew the client was going to do that, yeah. I knew the client was going to do that, why didn't you do something about it? Why didn't you address it straight away? Mm. And I think we've got this inane fear at the moment of telling the client no, and we've got an inane fear of withdrawing the candidate from the marketplace as soon as they're displaying the usual, they're ghosting, they're not coming back to us, they're becoming a little bit difficult on salary negotiations, whatever it be that they're doing, they're becoming a little bit difficult, and yet we've got this desperation to just carry on as normal because desperation is you know, Pink Floyd's is, is the English way. We just carry on and see whether we can get that person to the end of the end, end of the line. When actually, when we were we in know the recruitment, it's not we were dragging yeah, exactly, them out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When when it was a client market and there was loads of candidates available, we were starting to drag them out. But it's still about then providing quality because that candidate is a representation of your quality to your client, but also when you're working with your client and your client's doing the same to the candidate, that's a, your reputation to the candidate marketplace. So we've got to start to think that both of these sides start to create red flags. And if we don't address them, then that's our reputation that's tarnished more than anything else. It's not theirs. It's us because they will remember us because we supplied either that client or that candidate to each party. So I think we've got to sort of invest some time yep. in absolutely starting to think, say no and to withdraw candidates from yeah, the marketplace yeah. if they're not the right candidates and by the way how 10 out of 10 for getting a pink floyd lyric into today's yeah. webinar i mean i'm really yeah. in awe of that and i'll just add to the point that you guys have made um that with if another you pink floyd lyric well please? no i was thinking more about that if you don't if you don't qualify people it becomes a it becomes a hard day's night obviously <laughs> oh you know what happens when we when we put Beatles songs into things. <laughs> For those who don't know, when we first started doing our webinars, we did we were doing them with the with the the REC, and we decided on one of the REC webinars that you had to put as many Beatles tracks as you could into the REC, and I think I got about sixty odd Beatles tracks in, into that webinar, <laughs> and no one no one noticed, no one said anything. It was quite amusing from there, but that's a whole that's a whole different story. Okay, so. How do you ensure then that your team remain motivated and productive in a high pressured environment while remaining ex or, or maintaining exceptional service? OK, so I mean, there's something super important here, super important. I think as leaders of businesses, our job is about I mean, there's so many elements to what we have to do. But the number one priority is to make sure that our people are fully supported and that they're constantly invigorated, that you are front of brain daily, by the minute, by the hour, thinking about keeping people motivated, keeping morale high, making sure we celebrate even the smallest of successes, particularly in a, ch a challenging market, not spending too much time going into an awful lot of detail around the things that didn't work and, critic and criticizing those that, that failed. It's really about making sure that you have a clear vision, that you know where you're taking the business, that that is constantly communicated, uh, that people buy into the vision, buy into where the business is going, understand what's in it for them, make sure that you're constantly coaching and developing them. We work in an unbelievably quick changing market. And I think it's, it's really about creating a family environment. I mean, just quick anecdote. I, uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of my ex colleagues from Office Angels contacted me and we went for dinner and we hadn't sat in the same room as it were together for nearly 20 years. It was lovely. It was so much fun. And everyone on this call will know that when you have when you work very closely with people, it's as if you had, you'd spoken to them yesterday. You know, we click straight into conversations and that warm sort of feeling you have with people that where you've got that deep bond. And I was thinking about that afterwards. It was lovely. It was so nice to see them. Um, I was thinking about it afterwards and thinking, well, that wasn't an accident. You know, we worked really hard together, but we had this kind of family, close-knit um, environment. You know, we really loved each other. I don't mean that in a peculiar way, but we really were very fond of each other. And it was such a delight to see them. And I was thinking, <clears throat> isn't that the root of success? That if you take care of your people and you look after them and you really support them and you create that family environment, then you have the, the recipe for success. Um, and, and one that people still think about with great fondness nearly 20 years later. Heartwarming, Paul. Yeah. Love it. And um, the other thing I would say is let's let's link to the second half of Howard's question there about exceptional service standards. So, you know, the, the motivation, the high pressure, the productivity while maintaining exceptional so 
service standards. We've got to keep that link really clear. So it's not an add-on that we have exceptional service standards. It's fundamental to the other things. And we've got to keep that link to exceptional service standards in our culture, our values, our messaging, our rewards, our celebration, right? We, we don't do service standards because we're trying to make your lives more pressurized. <laughs> we're going to do it because actually it makes you more productive and it's the key to success because it links back to all the things that we've talked about in terms of closeness with our candidates and our clients. So service standards, the question then that I instantly spring to mind when you have that conversation there and that comment is absolutely right, Heather, is service standards to whom? Because we are outward focused and thinking service standards to our candidates and our clients. But as managers and as the business, the first service standard that I would always look at is to my staff. Nice. And so it's about demonstrating how we're going to execute the the. the what we need to execute we we'll demonstrate how we're going to get there it's using data using trends to identify things if you can start to motivate people great but motivation only lasts for a certain period of time so it's only creating the discipline and the habit to create that motivation high constantly and that's by constant training reviewing what goes well what's not work working well looking at your strategy looking at how you're executing that strategy mirroring your training and your coaching to what's actually going on and that starts to create momentum okay and once you start to create momentum then it's very hard to stop so you've got to start to think if you want to create momentum in 2025 as a manager and an owner of a business the first people that you need to motivate and have a high service standard to is your staff and therefore train them to be better, coach them, mentor them, be more with them. Your comment there, Paul, be more with them, yep. be in the trenches with them. And we've, we talked about this when it, you know, it, it was really, you know, the start of lockdown, we talked about who did you want in the trenches with you to fight yourself out of that? Well, we're in the same situation, you know, maybe it's slightly different, but who do you want to, you know, be there, with you when you lead forward you can't lead from the back in this type of marketplace you've got to lead from the front well, and therefore you've got yeah. to take your, your service standards to the next level and make take your team with and you just just a point here howard that's uh, we ought to make because i'm looking at the people that are on and there are one or two people i recognize as sort of solo recruiters and they don't have teams but i think under those circumstances uh, who keeps your morale up and i think that the answer is either you have close confidants that you can talk to people you've worked with people that you um, treasure value or you engage and are not this is not a set a cell it could be but you engage people like us people that will support you as mentors um, to help you because everybody needs uh, somebody whether it's a team or people they trust to help them through uh, the, the bad times or the difficult times but equally when things are booming and going well a good sound level a good sounding um board someone to talk to that will give you good strong advice and counsel so a very quick question then how do you then well it's not going to be quick obviously but <laughs> can you share a specific example and how you've managed to grow profitability without significantly increasing the fixed costs and what lessons can others learn from that okay i'll, st I'll start with a thing that that winds me up because it's awful lot. When you get to my age, you get grumpy, right? I get pretty grumpy sometimes, quite regularly, actually. One of the things that makes me grumpy is... Well, it's a de, de facto setting, isn't it? You no, know, it's me. This is who I... I've become Victor Meldrew. You know, that's a fact. Um, I, I, so, I mean, quite aside from the things that would make you roar with laughter that bother me and irritate me from a personal perspective, work-wise, it bothers me a lot when I speak to recruitment business owners who, are, who then bring in additional consultants when their own people are not not anywhere near the level they should be so we're increasing our costs we're bringing in more people but we've got consultants who are way below acceptable standards that haven't maxed out as you might say so i think where it starts is to make sure that you're and you mentioned this just a moment ago howard you're making sure you're coaching people consistently you're getting people to a, a level of ability and productivity and service level that you're happy with. Make sure that you do that. Don't increase the costs of your business. And the biggest costs that businesses have are generally speaking, not always, well, I think almost always outside of things like rent, 
the people that you employ or salaries. And by the way, at least I mentioned this because um, we're all aware of it. NI contributions going up, folks, in April, as we all know. So make sure that our people are producing for us the levels of competence that we expect from them. Don't start bringing in more and more people until you get to that kind of level. Um, and I think the other thing here, and we've talked about it, apart from coaching, it's you've got to look at your processes. What is it that works for you? I was talking to somebody yesterday um, that's uh, they're getting involved again in, um, well, in fact, with them, it's ISO. Um, so they're going through ISO standards again next year. And I, we had a lengthy conversation about analyzing what works, what doesn't work. Why do we do certain things? Is it worth doing those things any longer? Should we chuck some things out, and reintroduce new things or introduce new things? Look at the processes. Are they fit for purpose? Make sure that you're constantly reviewing it. You don't do it once a year because in the case of this particular business, you're looking at ISO all over again. It should be an ongoing thing. Um, and again, we've talked about it, but the client and candidate relationships, clearly we improve our profitability by having deeper relationships with our clients and candidates. And again, we've talked quite a bit about meetings and making sure we're close to people and good quality service. Those are the things that improve our profitability. And the last point we've already mentioned is making sure that you're constantly supporting and keeping morale up, keep supporting your people and keeping morale up. I've got a slightly different example from quite a big organisation um, who just cut out a big chunk of fixed costs um, by by moving to remote working. Yeah. So, you know, um, but this organisation, they were pretty big and their, fi their office costs were huge. Yeah. And that as soon as they took that out and that's pretty much, I don't know, 70% of it dropped into the bottom line when they moved to remote working Amazing. without any uh, loss of productivity. Um, so, you know, don't don't rule out. I know we don't want to get into the whole debate about work from home office space, but that, that is a fixed cost that is in your control to think about, just to throw that one in there. Let's hope there's no landlords listening to this today. <laughs> That's my pension, mate. So I'm, 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 I'm going to look at it in this in this way, then, that you've got two sides of the coin to, to look at to grow profitability. You've got your gross profit side. So what can you do to increase your gross profit? And I think things like driving CRM first environments where you're going into your CRM and you're absolutely updating it. You're keeping your candidates and your clients updated properly on that CRM so you can leverage them. And I remember going in 2008, we had this conversation constantly. Have you got 10 candidates that you can put into a position every Monday? So every Monday you have to have 10 candidates and place them into a, into a, into a new business or that have you. But you also had to have 10 clients that you could place those candidates to. So that means you had one candidate going out to five to 10 clients. So it had a massive opportunity to increase that. But what that did was massively reduce our cost on advertising. It massively yeah. dropped it because we suddenly had all of these candidates. You know, they're on your database, but we're not utilizing them. And as soon as we start to utilize those candidates, then we said, right, now we've got so many out of the marketplace. Now we need to go back onto the job boards to replenish the candidate base that we've already got. So let's think about what the candidates that we've already spent money on first and utilize them rather than then just throwing more candidates at the, at the and the, honestly how every sing, every single recruitment business that i know that has gone and done some analysis on where their candidates that they place come from discovers that they paid money to get them when they were already on their database yeah. every yeah, absolutely. single time that piece of work is done it's the same and then we turn the coin over and say right what's the cost of running our business and I would look at some of the redundant costs that you've got in your business that aren't creating any return on investment. How much of your tech stack are you actually using? You know, there'd be certain parts of your tech stack that you've bought and you're tied into an agreement that you're not using. If it costs you three months to get rid of it, get rid of it. Then look at that money. Don't say it's going to be a saving. Look at that money and say, right, what could I do with that money? Could I apportion that money? to training on my current tech stack. And if that then creates more time, et cetera, then that money is now well invested. And so all the time you're looking at how you can grow your gross profit and how you reduce your, your costs, then that gives you a bigger net or a bigger EBIT from there. But very seldom do we look at both sides of that. And very seldom do we sort of put things in place that says, actually, that will reduce that, that will reduce that but that gives us more profitability. And I think we've got to start to think about that in this day and age, 
but also moving forward because it will help moving forward. So last question. Looking ahead then, what trends or challenges do you foresee the recruitment industry for the recruitment industry and how can an agency position themselves for long-term success? So we know that technology is already biting our industry as it's biting every industry. Um, and there are a lot of people out there worrying about the future of recruitment. Then my answer to that is embrace technology, make sure that we use it to free up time, to use your phrase, um, for our people to do the things that the robots cannot do, which is to develop relationships with clients and candidates. Um, because the old adage about people buying people is becoming, as it were, more and more true. There's more and more truth to that as we go forward. And so I think that unquestionably our market is changing. There's a lot of new legislation uh, coming in, already in. Um, AI is really getting involved. But look, in the end, and we've talked about it throughout the entire webinar, it's all about people. It's all about developing relationships. It's all about being, uh, to use Heather's very correct phrase, being consultative. So for me, there's there's a very bright future in our industry, but we've got to find the time to develop those relationships. And you'll do that off the back of making sure your processes are streamlined, well thought through, well constructed, to your point, Howard, that you use your tech stack properly, that people are trained to use it correctly, and that we make sure our people are fully trained and competent and capable of being consultative and developing great relationships with the people that seek out our services. Yeah, and and I agree, Paul. Um, when when you've been in the recruitment industry as long as the three of us have, in our, with our combined two thousand years, years yeah. You, we have seen things come and go, right? We've seen predictions of, you know, it's the end of the world. This is the thing that's going to change recruitment. And all of those things do adjust recruitment, right? They impact it. They adjust. You've got to stay ahead of technology. You've got to stay ahead of trends, right? Absolutely. But fundamentally, recruitment hasn't actually changed. Good recruitment is getting the basics right. Use all of the tools that are out there, but remember why. They're not on their own going to change the industry unless they impact on the things that really matter, which is all the things that we've been talking about to do with relationships, people, yeah. cons consulting, all of those things. So they're all tools that we've got to keep our eye on, but fundamentally... They, they are only of value if they impact on those basic things that we know make good recruitment. Yep. So I think if you sort of think back, when Paul was placing administrators for Emperor Nero, the, <laughs> same, Nero, thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, the same thing applied. Okay. We thought it was a client market when actually it's a candidate market. Candidates are now going to be king for a very, very long time because the shrinking population or the shrinking birth rate in the UK, the population still growing because people aren't dying quick enough. Uh, but what we're thinking is that the actual birth rate is reducing and therefore there's going to be a shrinking working population constantly going on. So candidate is going to become king. And unless we start to sort of think about how we work with that market in a yep. better way yeah then that to me is going to be the instant area that we're going to sort of shape the recruitment market by having better relationships better services better dynamic with our candidate marketplace than we have at the moment yeah and if we can get that then we'll start to have a very very different flow and then clients will come and want to work with us because we have a product that they need to buy rather yeah. than a service that they want to engage with. There is yeah. two very different things. And if you think about the biggest company in the world, Amazon, they have a product that you want to buy. And when you walk through the door, their service is absolutely impeccable. And that's the difference. If you didn't have a product to buy, you wouldn't walk through that door. And that's the thing we've got to get our heads around is that service, okay, is one thing but having the product is the ultimate way to go. Ladies, nice. and, gen ladies and gentlemen, that's well it. Done. Paul, I've got nothing to say. Heather, thank you very much for your time. It's been, <laughs> been, been, been much appreciated. I'm, I'm glad that you had something to say, Heather, otherwise we'd have been it would have been 20 minutes in and we'd be in Paul would have been stuck.
I think not. Yeah, well, we've, been, we've, 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 been, <laughs> we've, we've, we've been rescued. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Shall I end with shine on you crazy diamond? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ladies and gents, thanks for your time. Pink Floyd tribute is over, but we'll see you all, <laughs> see you all next week for another webinar. Thanks very much. See, see you guys. Bye. See everybody. Bye. Bye.